Welcome everyone to our joint online service representing churches from Cartonell, Millhouses and Woodseats. A warm welcome to those who are part of our local church community and those that goes beyond the circuit and beyond that, even France. So welcome Reverend Claude and family in particular, good to see you. And to those who've joined us maybe uh, for the very first time, I hope and pray that you are keeping safe during these uncertain and testing times. And that whether you are viewing now or later on, that we hope our worship reaches out to you all. Our service today is led by David Harris. A warm welcome, David, and thank you once again for supporting the leading of, of the service. I've just got a couple of notices. First one is, for Car from Carton Old Church, we will be opening our building, our, we'll be having our service uh, on the 23rd of May, so that's really exciting and good news for us here at Carton Old, led by our very own Simon, so we'll keep you up to date as to uh, the preparations for that. And a plea as well for uh, those at Carton Old, we've sent out, leadership team sent out a questionnaire we really would value your feedback. Uh, it is important that we um, all join together in looking at all the tasks and the roles that's needed to keep the function of the church going. Uh, so we we'll, would value you uh, feeding, us, feeding all your um, comments back by the 28th of May. So we just need to pray on that, don't we? So a call to worship. Here we are, God, come amongst us. Here we are, Lord, listening for your word to us. Here we are, Jesus, seeking to follow you. And here we are, Spirit, needing inspiration. We have come, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Now we'll sing. Sing in the faith. It seems now a regular song we are singing. Come, let us sing to the one.
We now come to our opening prayers. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your presence with us. You move through all humans in strange and mysterious ways. We thank you for your wondrous works in using us. May you continue to amaze us. May we see you with fresh eyes of wonder each day. Amen. Our prayers of confession. Forgive us, Lord, for the times when we have not loved others and ourselves as you have loved us. Forgive us, Lord, for the times when we have not seen the way you are trying to guide us. Forgive us, Lord, for the times we have doubted you when we have forgotten that the Spirit is the truth. Lord, we know and are assured that you forgive all our sins. May we know that assurance this day and always. Amen. We now say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, as we forgive and forgive. Against our trespasses, as we forgive and our trespasses against us. For thine is the kingdom, power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We now have, a, have our first reading. Now, be honest, how many of you knew that <clears throat> this coming Thursday was Ascension Day? Now, Ascension, which comes 40 days after Jesus' resurrection, I think must be the most neglected of all the dates in the Christian calendar. Though in recent years, it's become the start date for the prayer project, Thy Kingdom Come, in which we're invited to pray every day until Pentecost for five family members or friends or colleagues who are not followers of Jesus. Now, you may be surprised to know as well that it's only Luke who tells us about Christ's ascension. And this is his second account of the ascension, which effectively links the end of his gospel with the beginning of Acts. Acts 1, 1 to 11. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered round him and asked him, Lord, at this time are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. 
Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Thanks be to God for this reading from his word.
We will now have the intercessions. Let us pray. God our Saviour, may these prayers which we offer you be also a renewing of our contract to love one another, even as Jesus has loved us. We pray for the end of bitterness and violence in its many forms. Bless all peacemakers, those who negotiate between nations or arbitrate within commerce and industry. Adjudicate in family courts, diffuse tensions in school grounds and counsel conflicting parties within church de denominations. We pray for the effective, compassionate care of all who are diseased, maimed or severely handicapped, including ailing members of this congregation. Bless all who work in clinics and hospitals, surgeons, physiotherapists, nurses, physicians, oncologists, psychiatrists, dietitians, social workers, dentists, pharmacists, and the staff of hospices for the dying. We pray for the feeding of the hungry, the clothing of the destitute, the housing of the homeless, the reformation of prisoners, and the rehabilitation of those who have been addicted to drugs. Bless every agency, church or government, which is dedicated to the care of our disadvantaged sisters and brothers. We pray for the provision of systems of justice that are truly fair, whether they are within our homeland, in other nations or international courts of justice. May those who are brought to court find equality before the law. Bless with insight and integrity each barrister and judge. Work in the mind and soul of every juror, that the innocent may be exonerated and the hearts of those sentenced turn towards repentance and regeneration. We pray for the church for all denominations, large or small, that we may love one another in practice as well as in prayer. Bless all joint initiatives in worship, fellowship and service to the community. May the world know that there is a grace at work in us, which is not our doing, but a gift from a lover who outstrips all others through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We will now have the second reading. Our second reading is from John's Gospel, chapter 15, verses 9 to 17. And here we find the disciples gathered together in the upper room just before Jesus' arrest, trial, and crucifixion. And he gives them what might be called the third great commandment, love each other as I have loved you. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now, Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands, and remain in his love. I have told you this, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. 
you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. Thanks be to God for this gospel reading. Amen. Can you hear me? We're okay. Good. Thank you. Right. Um, good to be with you. Thank you to my younger brother Michael for uh, reading so so well. It's always good to to uh, be, be with Michael. We go back a long way but that's another story. It's also good to be among friends. That shows how deluded I am. I, I, I just get this feeling when I come to Carter Knoll um, I'm, I am um, among friends. So just think for a moment. Who've been or who are your best friends? Is it a friendship that's lasted many years? Is it a recent friendship? Is it a friendship that comes and then goes? Maybe you find it hard to keep and make friends. I'm possibly in that last category. I've got lots of acquaintances, but I can find it hard to keep and real friends for any period of time. The number of real friends in my life I could probably count on one hand. The exception to that is my friend Barry. Barry and I grew up together in Rotherham. Um, we were tearaways. We were um, adolescents together. Um, if you've got time I could tell you long long stories about some of the escapades that Barry got up to, um, some of which um, would still get us into trouble today. Barry was a singer and for a while, remember when they used to be, you don't remember this because you're too young, but there used to be pop groups in the 60s and I used to manage a pop group in, in Rotherham and Barry was the singer and so everywhere we went, we went together. I was best man at his wedding and then we moved away. Geographically, Barry went down south and I went up north. And for months and maybe years, we weren't in direct contact. But you know what, when we did get back together again, as we often did, it was like it was yesterday. You know, we could just pick it up as, as if we'd seen each other the day before or the week before. It was a friendship that we could go right away from each other for months and years and come back and it was still there and it was still real. Barry was one of the best friends that I have ever had. About three years ago, Barry got stomach cancer and he died within about three months of that diagnosis. I still miss Barry and he will always be my friend. And I always think and reflect upon the nature of friendship. And then I think about Barry. There are times we were very close as teenagers there were times we didn't see each other for ages and yet that friendship was still there. It wasn't a friendship based on seeing each other every day but it was a real friendship nevertheless. In the reading we just heard Jesus said to his disciples you are my friends. Greater love has no one than to lay down his life for one's friends. You didn't choose me to be your friend, said Jesus, I chose you. And so, love one another. We are chosen to be Jesus' friends. You didn't choose me, but I chose you, said Jesus. I find that sentence interesting, but also a bit difficult. You see, in my friendships, there's always been an element of choice of both sides. In my much younger days, I quickly learned that if I wanted someone to be my girlfriend, it had to be a joint decision. It was no good me saying, 
but I've chosen you to be my girlfriend. There has to be an element of a choice on both sides. And yet Jesus is saying, you are my friends. You didn't choose me, but I chose you. In one sense, this is very reassuring. But does it mean that we have little choice in the matter? If we're chosen, I didn't, you didn't choose me, I chose you. If we're chosen to be friends of Jesus, where does choice, our personal choice, come in to that? And maybe we need to look a little earlier in the reading when Jesus puts a condition. You are my friends if you do what I command. Now, does this suggest that the gift of Jesus' friendship comes with conditions? Well, my reading of the passage suggests that Jesus has chosen us, you and me, to be his friends. And yes, we do have a choice. We have a choice to accept this gift of Jesus' friendship and to demonstrate it by committing ourselves to following his words and his teachings, or we can make a choice not to accept that gift of friendship and not to try and follow his ways and his teachings. Either way, the gift of Jesus' friendship to us is still there. We didn't choose Jesus to be our friend. He chose us. And like all gifts, it needs a response. Sometimes our response will be enthusiastic. Yes, please. I do want to accept that gift of friendship. I do want to respond by following your teachings and by following the ways that you set out for us. Sometimes it may be, well, thanks for that. I'm not quite there yet. Give me a bit more time, but I will try and respond when the time is right. For some, it will be more straightforward. Well, thanks, but no thanks. I guess the challenge and the privilege for us today is how we respond to the Jesus who's chosen us to be his friends. The Jesus who's invited us to share with him in bringing about his kingdom and his ways in our lives. You see, this morning, we're not here by accident. Jesus has chosen us, you and me, and he invites us positively to use his gift of friendship. So I was thinking, well, what does being a friend of Jesus mean to us today? I don't know if you always read the T's and C's, the terms and conditions, when you sign up for something online. I have to confess that I don't always. Sometimes I'll start off reading the T's and C's, and by the time I get to paragraph five, sub subsection three, I've had enough. It's too difficult, and so I just tick the box that says, yes, I have read and I've understood. What are the T's and C's? What are the terms and conditions of being a friend of Jesus. In fact, Jesus' T's and C's are very straightforward and also very brief, as we heard in the reading. Love each other as I have loved you. You are my friends if you do what I command. They're the terms and conditions that Jesus lays before us as he offers us the gift of his friendship. Love each other. You are my friends if you do what I command. Jesus has chosen us to be his friends. And this means that commitment to loving each other and to following his teachings. Love and obedience are the terms and conditions of signing up to be a friend of Jesus. Greater love has no one than this, says Jesus, to lay down one's life for one's friend. This kind of love that Jesus is talking about isn't slushy and soft. It's not the Love Island kind of love. I need to say at this stage, I've never seen Love Island. So maybe I'm talking about something I know nothing about, but it's not slushy 
it's not soft. As well as being joyful and life affirming, the love of Jesus can be tough love. Being friends doesn't always mean it's plain sailing. That's true of love between human beings. It can also be true about our friendship with Jesus. But we do have that promise. The promise that Jesus' love for us reflects God's love for him and is available to us today. So the friends of Jesus are fundamentally loved by Jesus and the Father, are bearers of a love that's associated with joy and is complete. Not servants anymore, said Jesus, but real friends. Real friendship is what's on offer. A friendship that's prepared to give up everything for other people. A friendship that's obedience. In some ways, it's a great equaliser. Each one of us is chosen by God equally. We're all God's adopted children. No people up there and people down there. No hierarchy. God says to you and me equally, you are my friends if you do what I command, if you love each other. We all have the same status in God's eyes. We're all loved by God and befriended by Jesus. A final story. Joseph Scriven was born in Ireland in 1820. He studied for a BA at the Trinity College in Dublin and he was engaged to be married. On the day before they were due to marry, his fiancée fell from a horse while crossing a river. She drowned and Joseph could only watch helplessly from the riverbank. Two years later, at the age of 25, Joseph emigrated to Canada, seeking his fate in a new world, as many young Irish lads did at that time. He worked as a teacher in Ontario. After a few years, he became engaged to a girl called Eliza. Shortly before the date of their marriage, Eliza died of pneumonia. Joseph was devastated. In some ways, through these tragedies, he came to appreciate for himself something of the friendship that Jesus had for him. He devoted much of the rest of his life to caring for the poor in the area of Ontario where he was living, and he also wrote poetry. He learned later that his mother back in Ireland had been taken very ill. He couldn't afford the fare to visit her, so he wrote a poem and he sent it to her. It reflected his own times of trial. It also, he hoped, would comfort her in her difficulties. That poem became, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, later set to music and included in an American hymn book. It's gone on to be one of the mo world's most well-known and most loved hymns. Written out of his sorrows, written trying to comfort his mother, Joseph Scriven's poem includes these lines. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. Have we trials and temptations? He certainly did. Is there trouble anywhere? Yet we should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend more faithful who will all our troubles share? Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Do your friends despise, forsake you? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms, he'll take and shield you. You will find a solace there. One man's experience of what being a friend of Jesus can really mean. And that's the friendship that's available to each one of us. It's available in our good times and it's available to us when times are hard. You are my friends, said Jesus. Wow, what a friend we have in Jesus. Amen. I think we're now going to sing the, the hymn, 
what shall our greeting be? What have I done? Thank you, everyone who has contributed to the service today. And a special thank you um, to David with his really important message. What a friend we have in Jesus. So important and so assuring, so comforting. So the closing words today. As we take our leave of this time of worship, we commit again to a life of worship, reflected in our actions, our thoughts, our relationships, and our ambitions. We will worship you, God of justice, this and every day. Amen. Now we share the grace together, so if we all unmute, The grace, the grace of, of our Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, the love, the love of, of God, God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Spirit be with, be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you.